I don't know whether to say good morning, good day. Hello. Um, you know, and Hello. Uh, I don't know whether to say, uh, Sis Nomshad, you represent a lot of things to me because of how I grew up listening to your show. And I remember even in my varsity days listening to your show. And uh, you've been such a huge inspiration to many of us. So hello to you. You're telling my age in very many ways. <laughs> <laughs> if you were at university. No, yeah. I don't mind that at all. Yes. In fact, I insist when I meet especially young people, mm. I'll give and a prefix. Including me, I'm still young. Yes. yes. I give a prefix. Because I, I find a lot of people sometimes get offended when mm. you acknowledge them for who they are. So depending on your age, I'll say, please call me Coco Shadow or mm. Mam Shadow or Anti yes. Shadow. Yes. But just don't go Shadow Twala. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. You know, because I think I've earned it. You know, you, I, I, it's interesting you should say that because people are thinking, well, this is your stage name. But then, you know, when you look at our culture and how we're raised, we, we're uncomfortable calling people who are um, for lack of a better word, um, mature. The elders or mature people uh, with their first name. You know, I, I, I struggle when I see some of the young people these days and just call anybody, whether it's the former president or the current president, mm. with them, you know, just mm. with their first name like that. Mm. Uh, but I guess, I guess you have to, we have to accept that we, we in, this is a new generation. We've that evolved, looks when I, and it's, it's, it's also how we we've we've nurtured our children and, and, and brought them up. Mm. We are responsible for that. Mm. It's also where the world is, you mm. know, first names, as you say, call the president by his first name. I don't think they mean disrespect, yeah. but that's the only way they know because the media says yeah. president so-and-so. Yeah. Um, and then you call them by name. And when they do wrong things, then you justify calling them by name without the prefix. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. You a journalist, TV radio producer, a DJ, entrepreneur, a mom. How do you juggle? A grandma. Oh, grandma even. How do you juggle? Because the profession was never permanent. Mm. You're always moving to into different spaces. Mm. So it's it's not your intention to to juggle really, mm. Mm. but it's responding to what calls you at the time. And the fact that our work was never a permanent job where you get a pension eventually. Mm. Our work has always been freelancing. So you get a contract for a year, for six months, for however long. Mm. So you always find time to look at other possibilities of either earning money, if you're doing it for money, and most of us are doing it for money. Although as you grow older, you realize that the money <laughs> is not going to do it. You do it for the heart. Yeah. You know, you... Yeah. you, you you do it for feeling good uh -huh. and the experience and meeting people. You have to uh -huh. look at um, other professions or find your career and chart a new path for yourself. Uh -huh. um, and, and this is how you survive. But it, it, it's not about juggling. I think uh -huh. you're forced to actually juggle. Okay. You know. Okay. We'll come back that, uh, to that in a moment. So maybe let's talk about your journey, uh, your upbringing. I mean, you were born in Soweto, you lived the better part of your life uh, in, in Cape Town, about 25 years or so, and then you, now you just came back. Um, yeah, walk us through your journey, your upbringing. I, I think there's something I'm chasing in my life, and I don't know what that <laughs> is, because I'm very nomadic. Yeah. Um, I've always been seeking, mm. so I travel a lot. I live in different places, even when I'm in one city, I'm moving from one suburb to another, you uh, know. Uh. I love spaces uh, and creating your own kind of environment. And it's also about the energy of what you're doing and what you're busy with. Uh. But born in, in Soweto um, and went and did my high school in Swaziland. Uh, and there was something else uh. Uh, that informed a different part of me. I've lived in, in so many places. but. Cape Town was 25 years because I started, I went to Cape Town to start a radio station uh -huh. and fell in love with um, just the city, but also 
uh, wanted to represent what is not easily recognized in Cape Town. Uh -huh. And everyone said, no, you're not going to last. I thought, oh, I'll show you. I'll yeah. last in Cape Town because <laughs> no one validates me. Uh, uh. I love the space. I love being there. So I'm going to stay uh. unless somebody physically removes me. Uh. But otherwise, I'm going to just enjoy Cape Town for what it is, as I would any other place I lived in. Uh. And, and until, until now, uh, I think the Joburg bug was calling as well. Uh. The vibrancy, the... the, 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 the just the energy in, 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 in Joburg is, is different. Uh. It's a big city and finding yourself and seeing how it's changed uh. Uh, and wanting to kind of memorialize your experiences in it. So I'm very curious as what was and what is uh. and how it came to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, and downtown is the best. I don't know why people don't want to live in the city. <laughs> it is the most vibrant environment ever. Yeah, I guess the city has changed as well. But you started your career at Radio Bob? Not really. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks I started at Bob. I was mm. there when Bob started. Oh. But, and I did a bit of television there. But my real career started on Metro mm. in 1986. Yes. We were the first voices on air on the 1st of September, 1986. Wow. And it, the bug bit and we stayed. Yeah. Your passion for radio, when did you discover that? We grew up listening to radio a lot. Msagas, wireless it was oh. called. You know, government gave us boxes <laughs> on the wall in Soweto. Yeah. And my, my dad, my parents had one um, and, and neighbors would come to listen to, to, to this. Yeah. And, and the other thing was that Dube, I don't know if you know that the parts of Soweto that is Dube was very different from the rest of Soweto. Yeah. The housing plans were different because the apartheid government thought it was an experiment yeah. for the kind of professionals that were teachers, nurses, yeah. you know, and, and those kinds of... So they just wanted to see how... Um, the, the elite at the time, and they were hardly elite, I mean, really. Uh, uh. But they thought it an educated uh. kind of community, how it would respond away from the rest of, of, uh. of Soweto. So Dube became the elite kind of space uh. where we got things first, where we got bathrooms in the house. Radio kind of took, took me in, uh. but I discovered later, my father worked for the SABC uh. as a sports presenter. Uh. My father was in the creative arts, he acted in, I don't know uh, if you've seen Joburg Jim. Oh. It was Jim Comes to Joburg, it was called the movie. Yeah. My father's in there oh. with Botoli Rateve and all of those people. And he was a, a, in a jazz band. And this oh. is why my love for jazz. So in a way, I kind of was influenced by him yeah. without me knowing. Oh. And some of these things I discovered after his death. Wow. In books and those kinds of things. Mm. So so to speak, you yeah. know, I, I suckled it out of, out of my family. Mm. So somebody was born in Dobe, I mean, did you um, have any association with Kaiser Chiefs in any way? Just no, no, fan? actually, mm -hmm. my father again yes. managed Morocco Swallow. So I grew up as an up the birds. Wow. For instance, when I was very popular with the, with the team, huh. when, when Dr. Kumalo's parents got married, I became the flower girl. You know. Wow. Yes, because Dr. Kumalo's dad played for Morocco Swallows at the okay. time. Okay. So I walked into, into Orlando Stadium in front of the officials and the team. Uh. Big 15 was my thing. Wow. You know? So we were in red and white. Uh. I remember wearing a sailor suit, uh. walking in front of everyone for Big 15 at Orlando Stadium. Uh. And of course, when we, when we won, it was... It was very dangerous at the time as well uh. because there'd be stabbings and those kinds of things and people didn't like uh. Uh, the, the, results. the results, you know, so <laughs> yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, but I'm uh. a big 15 girl. Okay. Mm. So for you to have a breakthrough, uh, you know, in terms of your radio uh, career, surely somebody must have believed in you. Uh, is there somebody in particular who played a key role in your life that you think, you know what? I think if there's one person who believed in me, who mentored me, or at least encouraged me, or paved the way, who would that be? Well, there are two people that mentored me in different ways, but one not for radio. Um, I became a ballroom dancer and won the championships in 1971 because Felicia Mabuza Sato yeah. used to run a, a ballroom dance school so that when we finished 
prime when school ends, uh -huh. we didn't hang around because our parents were not home. So she got hold of the YWCA, uh -huh. hired the hall there for all of us kids to come and dance and have a meal until uh -huh. our parents came back. Uh -huh. So we danced ballroom. I won the Latin American well. in 1971. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Yeah, I, I wasn't even born then. Well, I'm sure you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> so, who treasure Shabalala? Wow. When, when he was approached for Metro, because mm. he'd been working at Capital Radio, mm. he said to Gwosha Debe, listen, there's a young girl I know, and I know she's going to do well. Mm. Um, can we bring her in? And Gwosha came to see my mother mm. because my mother didn't want me working as a freelancer because there's no pension mm. and it's not a permanent job. She was worried about my money and my welfare. Mm. And of course came to negotiate with her. She eventually said yes. And I, that's how I joined radio. Yeah. So of course Khadebe and, and Treasure Shabalala were, were key in my career. I mean, those are household names when it comes to the entertainment world, yeah. So, I mean, with, with a TV career that spans over 30 years, and I say TV because, I mean, there's, there's radio, there's TV, and you've been involved in all that, and you've been a judge of SA Got Talent and all that. But just walk us through your journey. I mean, I mean when we're talking your um, career in that space, I mean, we're talking 702, we're talking uh, Radio Metro, uh, as it was, as it were then. P4. P4, and um, wow, just, just walk us SAFM, through SAFM, mm. eventually, which was my last one. But with television, it, it was very strange. Firstly, or just before Multi-Choice started, there was something called the OKTV OK Awards. Okay. They were like the summers, really. Mm. But they incorporated... Uh, acting and music. Mm. I mean, like it do, but once won something like 14 at the same time. You think Lauren Hill did well, mm. like it do, but did as well. But I was presenting those awards for the first time as a black woman mm. standing next to Ian de Foss. Mm. So we were all over the front pages of the Sunday Times. Mm. As the makeup artist was doing my, artist now, my, my makeup now, I said, please don't plaster me because. <laughs> They were trying to cover my black face so much with such thick makeup. <laughs> it, was, mm. it was incredible. But, mm. you know, I, it was an opportunity to be seen and, and to do what we did. Then eventually I did music shows and, 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 and those kinds of things. Mm. I did continuity announcing for Mnet, multi-choice at the time. Mm. Mm. It was Mnet before multi-choice. Mm. And in between movies that... Mm get a presenter to tell you what's coming up. But I was just starting to have my dreadlocks and they, re they, they, they asked me to wear a wig and I refused to wear a wig because my dreadlocks were not. Hmm. So what they did, they sprayed my hair to flatten it so that it didn't look like anything and just pat it down because sure. they really, it was disgusting for them to have my dreadlocks wow. there, but I, I refused. Hmm. So, so that journey was actually quite nice because one led to another. Hmm. But the highlight of it, after Essays Got Talent had gone a long time ago, mm. I didn't get this call in, in 2018. I thought I was being scammed. Huh. Uh, CBS in the US wanted my services huh. and we couldn't talk about it. Huh. And what it was is they gathered 50 presenters from 50 countries huh. to come and do what was called the world's best. So it's an, it was also a reality show where okay. musicians came to but we had to choose the world's best. Mm. So I worked at CBS wow. at, at a very old age <laughs> in 2018. Sure. And um, it was very exciting mm. to do that. And I think that becomes then the end of it. Wow. You mentioned earlier that, you know, when you started uh, at uh, Radio Metro, um, your, your mother wasn't comfortable with this mm -hmm. freelance gig and all that. And I guess for the better part of, I guess for the rest of your life, I mean, you never had a nine to five. You've always been a freelancer. And I, obviously what that means, you need to have the ability to manage your cash flow and manage your money. How, how did that work for you uh, throughout your career? Firstly, you had to negotiate what you thought you were worth. Mm. We always came short as women, especially, because mm. mm. we knew what our guys were earning. Uh, but you, 
you couldn't get the same amount, uh. but you wanted the job. Uh. You loved the, the fact that you're going to get another guarantee for a job for the next 12 months. Uh. So you took whatever you could. Uh. And eventually you divorced yourself from the fact that you're working for money. Uh. The job was beautiful. Uh. I mean, the mic is addictive. Yeah. You know, you meet so many people. Uh. In fact, I did lots of shows for the old mutual then. I still have pictures. I know. <laughs> but, you, you know, you, you then kind of divorce yourself. You, don't, you, you think, okay, give me whatever you think I'm worth. Uh. But I'm working. Uh. I've got a job to do. Uh. So you, you almost shut your mind out. Uh. Uh, because money became an uncomfortable thing to talk about. Yeah. And growing up as a child as well, you know, money was never kind of spoken about. Yep. And when it was spoken about, it was like, hey, hey none of your business. <laughs> you know, your dad and I are working it out, you know. Uh -huh. So money for me became a, a, a negative energy. Uh -huh. It was something not to be acknowledged. Uh -huh. I heard a philosophy at some point that says money is there to pass through hands. Uh -huh. It's there to be spent because it needs to circulate. So don't hold on to it. It's an energy to be passed around, do what you do with it, but uh. go and buy something because somebody else needs to move things. Uh. So it makes the world go around, not to be hoarded. So I, I was in two minds about money and eventually I thought, you know, as long as I'm alive, I'm kicking, uh. I've got a roof over my head, uh. um, money is going to be the last thing I talk about. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges for a freelance uh, would be because there's, it's, you're dealing with uh, seasonal income. What do you think is or needs to happen or needs to be done by f a person who is a freelancer um, who doesn't have a fixed income? Yeah, it's fixed for as long as the contract is, is there. Is there mm -hmm. But when they decide tomorrow, and they can do it any time, and these days they did by SMS. Mm -hmm. uh, we're chatting to uh, uh, Robert Marawa the other day, and he talked about how he just got an SMS. Hmm. You know, no, 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 no. Your, your job can be cut any time. Yeah. And not because you're not good at it, hmm. but it's because somebody just doesn't like you. They thought you think you're too powerful. Yeah. So, you know, they, they let you go. Yeah. I fought the SABC once and lost, obviously, when I was unfairly dismissed. And guess who my last employer was again? It was the SABC <laughs> <laughs> under a different guise, you know? But I, I don't think. Uh, anything has changed for freelancers. Uh. Um, you, now you need legal representation and sometimes management does not want to deal with agents or legal people because they don't want to bind themselves like that. You take uh. what the SABC uh. or anybody else. Well, there's free, there's, there are new radio stations that are independent now where there's a possible negotiation. Uh. But you, I, I guess you'd need to be clever enough to... Uh. To, to save as much as you can, uh. when you can, uh. but also when you are in the media space, you need to look good, you need to drive a nice car, uh. you need to, you know. Uh. So where do you choose that? You need to go uh. out and meet people and have meetings and restaurants and that uh. sort of thing. Where do you go and do that when you're skimping on money? Yeah, but isn't that part of the problem that if the system uh, is designed in such a way that a person feels that I'm in the limelight, I need to drive a very expensive car. Isn't that part of the problem that puts people under pressure because I need to conform to a particular image? Well, I use that as an example, but actually when you're a freelancer, you don't even get a loan for a house or a car. Yeah. Because you cannot. Mm. Uh, banks need a guarantee that you're going to be able to pay back over mm. a period of time. So, you know, they, they kind of examine your income. Yeah. So. I, I, I think now, because young people have got influencer status, Ish. so they get sponsored with oh. stuff. Oh. They, don't have to, they don't have to buy stuff anymore oh. uh, or own anything much. I suppose oh. the home you need to own, oh. but everything else from their clothes to oh. their outings, and you, know, and you just put yeah. it on social media, look where oh. I am, and you yeah. know, it's, it's wonderful. But I've got no fixed advice because, especially for young girls and oh. women, oh. It's, it's the wage gap is, is always going to stay where it is, mm. maybe at a lesser percentage, mm. but women are finding it harder, especially black women, yeah. uh, to, to, to break through that ceiling as far as money is concerned. Yeah. So what has been some of your biggest money lessons? Biggest money lessons? Mm. I hope I've learned some. <laughs> <laughs> I keep learning. Yeah. 
I don't know. I, I don't know if there would be lessons because I'm learning as I go along. Mm. At my age, I, I still, I think I find, I still block conversations about money. Mm. I still don't come out clearly. And I've gone to examine why. Mm -hmm. So I've had to do a lot of meditation and self-seeking mm -hmm. and see what I'm dealing with that makes me feel so uncomfortable and so unsafe talking about money. Mm. Uh, because I've never had to talk about money with anybody. Mm. Thankfully, I've never been married. So mm. I've never had a partner to, to kind of say, with my children, it's different. Because mm. we're very open about it. Mm. But, and I suppose that's why I, I've got now a comfort space mm. of even interrogating myself to say, what is it with you about money? Yeah. You know, because again, we grew up thinking money is evil. Yeah. The root of all evil. But in fact, it's not the money now I'm learning. Mm. It's the people who have money who do evil things. Yes, yes. So, but that mindset to mm. just unlearn mm. what you've learned and relied on all your life sure. is, is, is the journey that I'm still on. Yeah. So I, I can't give anyone my lessons. In fact, I'm hoping to get lessons from you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the reason I agreed to come here, I thought, oh, it may change my life, you know? I may walk out of here a better person and go out there and be wealthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I guess, you know, for, for a legend like you to have survived in the industry for so many years, surely there must be something that must look at and say, wow, what a legend. Because, I mean, for you to have survived this long, you must have found a secret to managing money. Well, I, a secret of how to mismanage money successfully. Maybe. <laughs> but, yes, yes. Maybe, maybe that. But, but, but also, I, the, the thing is, I didn't deprive myself of things I love. Yeah. So I went and collected mm. and protected mm. quality stuff. Yeah. So I collected lots of beautiful rugs mm. that were worth a lot of money, mm. paid for them in a short space of time, mm. collected lots of meaningful artworks mm. that would be my investment. Uh-huh. Uh, so without knowing, because I love them and I love the people that produce them, I collected a lot of them. Uh. And hopefully they'll, I can monetize them uh. when the time comes. Uh. But my collection was not about eventual money. Yes. At the time it was, I wanted to surround myself with beauty. Uh. I've always rented, again, because you don't get a loan for a home. Uh. And everyone would say, how do you rent? You're paying somebody's bond. Please keep quiet because, you know, uh. that's the easiest thing I can do uh. in order to afford myself these things. So I, I, I think one of the lessons would be find things that will give you joy firstly, yeah. Yeah. but also what the cost of it will escalate eventually uh. to be an investment. Uh. So even if you buy a piece of art from the road at 10 Rand, uh. but if it's a good piece of art, then uh. it'll last you. And of course, yeah. the price goes up over years. Okay. I think that's a, the that's a thing I've done, but I've never been extravagant. I love traveling. Uh -huh. But maybe just to underline that, you've never been extravagant. Because, but isn't it maybe a situation for some people that, okay, I, I tend to overspend and I flesh out and that's why. Oh yeah, because you can get a lot of peer pressure uh. to become somebody else or uh. to show up. Uh. Because we always want to we can only be acknowledged uh -huh. when we show up in a particular uniform. Uh -huh. So when you look the part, people acknowledge uh -huh. you and yeah. they notice you, they see you. Uh -huh. But when you don't look the part, that's, the, that's a telltale of uh -huh. where your s status is. Yeah. Then people don't see you, regardless of how good you are and what you do. People uh -huh. just don't see you because uh -huh. they're also trying to rub shoulders yeah. with people that look like them. Uh -huh. so, and I think that's the biggest fault right now keeping up with the Joneses, you yeah. know? And I think, I think companies also have marketed to that ideal uh. that these guys have got new money, uh. so they'll drink this kind of drink, they'll drive this kind of car. So you're under pressure constantly. Yeah. I know people who apparently go home during Christmas holidays to the rural areas uh. because they work in Johannesburg, uh. They need to go home and show off and show what off they've achieved. Um, yeah. But they haven't achieved that yet. So they'll rent uh, a car uh, and drive it there to say, look at me now, and then come back. So we need, our, we need to change our minds as far as that philosophy is concerned. No, absolutely. You know, because why should one feel 
that they need to validate themselves or they need to be accepted by virtue of uh, conforming to a certain image. You know, so you want to become a being, but somebody defined what this being is, and you're always gravitating towards, and you're spending money just to conform. It's a system. Hmm. That's how we've been brought up. Hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's deep set as well. I mean, we, we came from an era where we were not good enough, we were not beautiful enough, we were not uh, acceptable. Hmm. We were almost animals in the way we were treated. So that's why we, we used to straighten our hair, use uh, skin bleaches just to be accepted because the image was we wanted to look like this person mm. that is bright and lovely and shiny. So the pressure came, apart from how we looked, we wanted to uh, live where they lived. Mm. We wanted to drive what they drove. We yeah. wanted to speak like them. We wanted to, you know, so that you are accepted as a human being. And now that we have almost there, you realize the rules of the game have changed. No, indeed. I, I didn't need to do all of that. I spent yeah. my life doing that. Hmm. I guess that's probably one of the reasons uh, a lot of artists or people who are freelancers struggle during COVID, because they had no safety net, nothing yeah. put aside for a, a, an economic shock. How did you survive I COVID? I can tell you that for free. <laughs> I sold everything I had. Wow. I sold car, I sold... I cashed in my insurances, I cashed in wherever I could to survive that two years. Sure. I even tried starting a side hustle, mm. you know, because th that's where you were. Yeah. You know, you, you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't do anything because the industry as well that I work in, which is the, in the creative industries, in the entertainment world, it was hit hard. Clubs shut down, oh. restaurants shut down, there were no concerts. And that's our space. Uh -huh. So from, from tech guys uh -huh. to performance to venues, it was a challenge. Yeah. And people just did what they had to do. Yeah. I guess finally, um, if I may ask, I mean, you've got such an illustrious career. I mean, you are a living legend. I'm sure there are a lot of people like myself and other young people who are looking forward to get into the industry who look up to you and say, wow, I mean, what a career. How far are you from getting to a point where you say, you think, I think I'm going to hang my boots? I cannot. That's my death. <laughs> no, that's my death. I'm yeah. going to do as much as I can for as long as I can, because now I'm doing it for me. Yes. But not only for me, but for the society I live in, I think we've got lots to learn from each other. Mm. We've got lots to teach each mm. other and share. But my, my biggest dream is to, is to see us all acknowledge each other, not of how we look, but accept each other mm. in our diverse, because we live in a diverse yes. country. Mm. But we need to understand that we're all the same person. Mm. You know, we, we, we all you reflect me. Yes. I look at you, I see me. Uh. You're my mirror. Uh. And only if we can just try and blur the lines that uh. the system has drawn for us, uh. there's more common in us than difference. Uh. And if we can find that, I mean, the food we eat, the, the, the things we do, how we live, uh. is just really the ties that bind, the, the links between us. So if we can have those conversations continuously, uh. And, and understand why we, we do the work that we do. It's not because, yes, it's because it pays us, mm. but just to stay, the longevity of you being in it yeah. is to strive for something absolutely, absolutely important for humanity. Yeah. You know, um, for, for freelancers, uh, entertainers, the advantage for them is you can work for as long as your body Allows. Is a, allows, yeah, you know, but then, of course, there's always this curveball if your body says stop. And if you've not worked for your money to a point where when you're unable to work, your money can start working for you, what do you think needs to change in the system and as well as in the mindset of entertainers to deal with the issue of retirement and being comfortable and ready to say, I can retire whenever I want to retire? 
that years not to retire, but I hear you when you say your yes. body won't let you. Mm. But I think that the system also needs to accommodate and have different packages. Mm. The other day I was, I was at a, a brand, uh, brand South Africa uh, conversation where they're talking about unemployment with the youth. Mm. And I said the biggest mm. challenge with youth self-employment and unemployment mm. is the, the banking system and the business world. The language of business is mm. different. Mm. But also, the challenge is money. Huh. We, we've got very beautifully talented young people huh. who can start a side hustle now and becomes. But there's no access to funding. Huh. So how do you then tell them to go and start doing a job when there's no access to funding? Because the packages don't change. Huh. So banking and big business needs to change the way they fund. Huh. I mean, you've got, I've got companies that I listen to all the time say, you know, but you must have two-year guarantees of your business. Who's running that business for two years? Yeah. So how does a young man who's just finished high school, uh, maybe even graduated, yeah. wants to go and, and open a bookstore or even wants to go and wash techies for other people, uh, but needs a little, you know, uh, uh, help him get there. Uh, He's not going to come to you with... As bank statements for the past two years, oh. where does he get them? Yeah. So, 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 Old Mutual as well needs to rethink the way freelancers, as you understand today, cannot save for retirement. Oh. How do you assist them save for retirement? Oh. How do you take the little bit that they have for that year oh. and give them a reprieve, for instance, for when they're not working? Oh and start premiums again. Yeah. And this whole thing of, and this is why people don't have a retirement or anything, huh. because when you stop paying, it expires. You don't yeah. get anything back. Yeah. So what happens to all that money that you paid? Yeah. I guess it's also a question of uh, knowledge, financial knowledge, because honestly speaking, when you're investing, it doesn't mean that when you can't continue, your money must just evaporate. You, you need to have the right financial advisor to guide you and put your money in the right instruments so that you actually don't lose your money. I met someone the other day who says he wishes they, he had been taught oh. about taxes when he was at high school yeah. instead of biology yeah. or something like that, oh. you know, because then he'd, he'd know to pay his taxes. Oh. And this is what should be taught at school about retirement, oh. how you, and then policies must change. I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about financial education, financial knowledge, because honestly, I get shocked when I hear people say that, ah, oh, if you put your money there, then you can't continue, then you've lost your money. But then the question, the, the question is that, were you properly advised? Did you get By the right who? advice? So that this is where it becomes important to choose the right partner. So, well, today is not about uh, punting a brand or product and so on. But I mean, in all the years I've worked in financial services, I found that people just don't know. Um, so, you know, there's a big difference between a risk uh, policy and an investment instrument. So at times when people are not properly advised, they tend to consider that it's the same thing. For example, if you've taken a life cover, uh, it, it, it's a lady society. Mm. You know, when you're in a society, mm. yes, they will allow you to skip now and again, they'll carry you, but it gets to a point where even the society itself says, well, we, we, we think this partnership is no longer working. So for us, On The Money is about empowering people to understand that there is what we call financial education, but a financial education on its own is not enough. You can, be, you can be empowered with knowledge, you still need to apply. To apply the knowledge, you need the right financial advice. So these two actually work in tandem. I mean, if you look at... Uh, uh, a lot of literature around the world around exactly when it comes to financial planning, you see that there's a very strong relationship between financial education and financial planning and financial inclusion. So, but these are things that I think South Africa is grappling with and um, I'm, I, I think there's a lot of work that's happening. It might not have had the kind of desired impact that perhaps we should see but it's just unfortunate that there's still a lot of perception out there about, about the industry, and for various reasons, rightly or wrongly. But nonetheless, I guess this type of podcast are there to address some of those things so we can deal with those perceptions. I'm happy, I'm happy that you're concentrating on financial education, but maybe it, it should also start from 
uh, an earlier age while people are at uh, school yes. or at university uh. um, I, and it, I know it exists in universities when young men especially who study medicine mm. and they guaranteed a good salary yes. and companies go running to them and say uh. we'll give you a loan yeah. you know yeah. but I, I, I th I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's conversations and, and you must also look at cultural conversations that can happen yep. because as I say with some of our uh, traditions uh, you don't speak about money uh, it's only the adults that speak about money even then it may be just dad's responsibility sure. and mom must stay away from it and has her own budget so uh, the cultural implications uh, of of financial of retirement or uh, financial education uh, I think ought to happen yeah. in in different spaces but I'm I'm so happy for this podcast yeah. because you're reaching uh, a community that you may not be able to reach otherwise absolutely yeah. and I hope this conversation will help somewhat yes Memshad, thank you thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate your time with us and I trust that a lot of people learn a lot from your wisdom and how the way you navigate the financial talks. <laughs> and and um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been absolutely great. Thank you so much for... Well, you've for got me it. watching now all the time. I'm going to be looking out for these. Thank and you, I'll be hooked because yeah. I still need to learn, as I said. Thank mm. you for having me. It's our pleasure. Thank you.